Wow, they weren't kidding when they said they wanted to take Doom 2016 back to their roots. It was a really ballsy move to go back to the original id tech engine, but I think it paid off really well. Oh, hold on, I've just been informed that I am playing the wrong Doom 2016. Okay, this better be the right one. Yeah, I think this is it. Alright, this isn't gonna age well. Doom 2016 is one of the greatest video games I've ever played. It took the series back to its roots with a fresh yet familiar coat of paint, and embraces everything that made the classic Doom games so enjoyable. To say that it went through development hell is a gross understatement, forcing John Carmack out of the company when Bethesda didn't want to give the game virtual reality support, and <laughs> look at how well that turned out for them. I fucking love cleaning! Bethesda's parent company ZeniMax bought out its software and all of their IPs, including Commander Keen, Doom, and Wolfenstein, the latter whose reboot brought us into a sort of FPS renaissance of shooters, returning to what made them so great in the first place where combat and exploration is just as rewarding as finishing the level itself. However, Doom 4, which was in development at the time, was really struggling to get off the ground. Once again, John motherfucking Carmack wanted the game to be a technical wonder first, and a game second. This video that you're seeing right here, this isn't footage of an old cancelled Call of Duty game, Game, this this was going to be doom they did salvage the push forward combat that the game was planned to integrate with some of the animations even being reused in the game that we now know as doom 2016 but everything else that was gone out the window the team did undergo some staff changes bringing in concept artist hugo martin to lead and eventually direct the doom project hugo martin is a huge fucking nerd and i just i absolutely love him he's everything that i loved about john romero just without the ego and going through some of his older projects i think that he's He's a perfect fit for a franchise like Doom. I mean, the dude ended up designing a handful of Jaegers from the Pacific Rim film, and that movie is pop culture incarnate. Come on. Everything I just told you though, the public knew basically nothing about outside of unproven rumors, and the game wouldn't have its first public appearance until E3 2014, showing a teaser with the new and improved Cyber Demon, and then silent again for another year when gameplay was finally shown for the game. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Doom. Watching this now, it's almost kind of unsettling. The gameplay is so slow, the colors look so muted, and it just lacks the charm that we'd eventually get with the final product. Like, look at the imp, he's basically just a baby hell knight, he doesn't look that nice. Glory kills were here though in full force, brutal finisher animations that reward the player with more health and ammo than they would with a normal kill, encouraging you to play more aggressively than you would hiding behind cover. This was a step in the right direction though, with demons being easily recognizable from first glance, being a step up from Doom 3, especially with the Revenant, who's back to being a screaming skeleton with a jetpack who punches you to death. That is so fucking awesome. If you've played the game, you might not recognize the version of At Doom's Gate that's playing right now. That's because the absolute god and musical genius Mick Gordon was told by Bethesda that they didn't want a metal soundtrack for the game. Okay, let me let me uh, repeat what I just said. Bethesda didn't want a metal soundtrack for Doom. Oh, good god. He did his best to follow that no metal sound rule until basically saying, fuck it, I'm making this metal anyway, and Bethesda did eventually cave in and allow it. I've heard rumors that this is what led to the speed of the game eventually being increased too, but I couldn't find any proof of that, so take that how you will. Needless to say though, fans were kind of divided about this one. It looked nice and looked like it was a return to form since Doom 3, but the E3 presentation put a large emphasis on multiplayer for some reason, which made some worry that the game was being produced with multiplayer in mind first and single player second. I know that Doom pioneered the concept of deathmatch, but still, it worked because it built off of the elements from the single player game, including maps and weapons, and many were worried that this was going to be the other way around. Also, Hell just looked like piss. Literally, everything has this gross shade of yellowish green that doesn't really scream hell to me. But I love the architecture, so all we really need here is a bit of color correction. Worries about the game continue to grow when Bethesda withheld review copies from the media, a telltale sign that the company isn't confident in their game. And maybe they weren't, but their worries proved to be for naught when the game finally released to near universal praise from veterans and newcomers alike, including myself. Would you believe that this was my first true Doom experience? I did play the series a little bit 
growing up, but I never truly got into it. But all of these videos about the series till this point were from the perspective of someone who hasn't spent more time with Doom than his family. It was from the perspective of a guy in his early 20s who had never sat down and played through the entirety of a Doom game until late 2016. Put that into perspective. Right from the get-go, the most noticeable gameplay element that makes this game stand out is the glory kill mechanic. Well, actually, the first thing you'll notice is why the home menu looks like a free-to-play game. What, what is this? It used to look like this, which I liked way more. It's much cleaner and much more minimalistic. Anyways, when demons get to a lower point in their health, they glow until you get close enough to connect them with a melee attack, bringing you into a short but satisfying finisher animation. You can get a perk later in the game that speeds up the animations of glory kills, but I don't really like to use this because I enjoy having an opportunity to blink while I'm in combat. It also lets me reset my mouse if it's slightly off position. I have seen some say that they find the flashing of the demons to be a little bit immersion breaking, and while I disagree, I do understand it. But what I don't completely understand is why people complain about it when they could just turn it off. You could also turn off other things as well as tutorials and other quality of life changes, including the weapon placement. In a more recent update, they've allowed you to reset the weapon position to be in the center of the screen, much like Classic Doom, which I think is fine until you get to any weapon that isn't the combat shotgun. The weapon bobbing is just a bit too distracting for me, and I think that some of the weapons take up way too much of the screen. Also, it seems just slightly off-center. Does this bother anyone else? Though I do appreciate that they reanimated the classic shotgun cocking, that's that's good stuff. Now everyone get out of the way before I blow you up with my massive rocket cock. A lot of this feels like a love letter to classic Doom, with most if not all of the demons and weapons following the same hierarchy they did in the originals, but with some tweaking to adjust for the third dimension and push forward combat. Imps linger from a distance and throw fireballs, but are much faster and run away from you sometimes. Zombie dudes now use plasma beams instead of bullets, which might turn some veterans off, but I think that this is way better than the hit scanning shots, and shotgunners aren't nearly as much of a pain. They do have shields, but this can be popped by some stronger weapons in the game, and this encourages you to find a route to easily attack their backside, and the list goes on. Weapons now have up to two interchangeable weapon mods that can give them some much needed utility. You're first shown this midway through the first level of the game, with the choice of the explosive shot or the triple shot for the shotgun. Right away you might gravitate to the explosive shot, which I do think is better, but the triple shot is great for bigger enemies you'll encounter early on, like the Hell Knights. Meanwhile, you've got the plasma plasma pistol from Quake 2, a heavy rifle with a missile or scope add-on, the plasma rifle with a stun bomb or burst AoE. The super shotgun doesn't have any weapon attachments, but it can be upgraded to fire each shell separately, each dealing as much damage as a normal shot, basically doubling the damage of the super shotgun. Jesus Christ. The rocket launcher has a remote detonation or lock-on burst, and the chain gun with the Gatling rotator or mobile turret. <laughs> And then you have the Gauze Cannon, which is the only new weapon in Doom 2016. Functionality-wise, it's basically just the railgun from Quake 2, but when you get the Siege Mode upgrade, I think it functions more like the BFG from the classic games. It shares ammo with the plasma rifle, it takes a while to charge up, and it just decimates everything in front of you. It is a bit overpowered, it can take out enemies like Mancubi in like two shots, and it's able to one-shot Hell Knights. This thing is kind of broken. This large of an arsenal allows you to mix and match and find your own playstyle. You don't need to use every weapon mod, but the option is there if you like it. And even going complete balls to the wall and mixing up weapon attachments mid-combat leads to an intense style of aggressive gameplay that I can't really compare to any other game that I've played before, where again, combat feels almost as rewarding as the game itself. Oh yeah, keep them coming! You you fucking want some? I need a new pair of pants. Alright, but here's the thing though, you don't have to play like this, and there's nothing encouraging you to play this way aside from personal goals. Doom is at its peak when you're managing your resources, juggling weapon ammo, chainsaw fuel, BFG cells, etc. And it's incredibly rewarding playing that way. However, there's nothing stopping you from spamming the same two weapons over and over. In my first playthrough of this game, I almost exclusively used the Super Shotgun and Gauze Cannon, and rarely used anything else. There's nothing to punish you for exploiting this, and I wish that I didn't have to say this, but it's true, these weapons really do rip the game in half when fully upgraded. Though aesthetically, there's some questionable decisions. I'm fine with none of the weapons really looking like their classic counterparts, but I'm mixed on the plasma gun looking like its Doom 3 counterpart. It kind of feels out of place. Though then 
again, I didn't care for how it looked in that game anyway. I do love the design of the pistol, especially when you're charging it and the flarings on the side come out. I just hate that the first shot isn't perfectly accurate though. If you're spamming the thing, sure, that makes sense that you would have some spread, but why can't the first shot be accurate? Though enjoy how the pistol looks because we're never gonna see it again. I feel like the sound design for the rocket launcher could use some beefing up as well, but aside from that, I think the rest of the arsenal is fucking nice. You won't spend as much time looking for ammo and health around the map as you would in Classic Doom, and I'll tell you why. Ammo now drops from demons. How they got it? Doesn't matter. All that matters is that if you want to maintain your ammo, you better keep killing shit. If anything, the only thing that you should keep an eye out for is armor and chainsaw juice. Yeah, the chainsaws no longer hold Mouse 1 to win like in the Classic games. You have a limited amount of uses for it, but we'll be getting to that later. Demons are introduced to you throughout the game at around the same pace as you acquire weapons, seeing nearly every demon type and weapon by around the fifth level of the game. However, you do find new weapon attachments up until these final stages, as well as other upgrades like Argent Cells that boost your health, ammo, and armor, to Praetor Tokens, which act like a sort of skill tree for perks like immunity to explosive barrels, faster weapon switching, and extending power-up timers. Something about the exploration in this game just clicks something in my brain. That feeling of playing a game on a late summer night with all of the lights off, walking around, collecting things, uh, it just feels good. It almost brings me back to playing Metroid Prime in a way. Power-ups are back like the Invulnerability and Berserk from Doom, and the quad damage and haste from Quake. In a way, Doom 2016 almost feels like Avengers Infinity War of id shooters, finally crossing over things from previous games, and <laughs> I'm not complaining. Though sometimes the timers pause for glory kills and sometimes they don't, I still haven't found out a distinction of what causes that, and I don't have the perk that extends power-up timers, which is kind of broken letting the Berserk last this long, but god damn does it feel good! Like we said before, the chainsaw isn't unlimited and can only be used a set amount of times depending on how much you've upgraded your ammo capacity. This forces you to prioritize which demons you want to use it on. Do you want to use three charges on three smaller imps, or do you want to use all three charges to one-shot a Hell Knight? This once again emphasizes the resource management that Doom 2016 tries to integrate, and every enemy turns into a massive ammo pinata. Loading screens also like to give you hints, like if a demon has a head that's its weak point, and that hint is actually kind of bullshit and I'll tell you why for one reason. Pinkies. Pinkies are back, but they now have full armor plating on their front side. They're more or less the same demon from the old games, but this time you have to do this little dance to get around them. It's fine, I actually really like this change over the older games, I'd much prefer this over the walls of flesh running at me from before, but again, this hint is bullshit. There's also runes in this game, not to be mistaken with Quake's runes, which did absolutely fucking nothing. These runes are challenges that break up the gameplay a bit with more casual minigames, and upon completion rewards you with an equipable rune that modifies the gameplay a little bit. These range from vacuum, which extends the range that you pick up health and armor pickups, to also letting demons drop armor upon being glory killed, which combined with another rune that gives you infinite ammo above a certain threshold means you're never going to run out of ammo. These runes are awesome, but I only ever use a specific set of them, meaning that in repeat playthroughs of this game, I really only gravitate to those three, with a personal favorite of mine being Seek and Destroy, which extends the range of your glory kills a little bit and can be upgraded, turning Doom Guy into a fucking teleporting Akuma motherfucker. Or I guess I should say the Doom Slayer. Doom 2016 has much more of an emphasis on story compared to previous entries. Probably more story and lore than Doom 3, but with much less of it shoved down your throat. The basics are all still here, the UAC opens a portal to hell and faces the consequences of their greed, but their expeditions aren't for nothing, and their corruption leans more towards financial exploitation and greed rather than it being a secret cult. There are still plenty of culty activities going on under the surface, sure, but much more of it is in a rather grey area. The UAC found a source of unlimited energy in the form of Argent Plasma on the surface of Mars, and once they found that it came from Hell, they decided to expedite the place for more of it until one of their lead scientists, Olivia Pierce, goes a bit too deep, taking artifacts from Hell and eventually turning full cultist, overseeing human sacrifices and growing these monstrosities in their office. Is that the fucking mother demon? But in her research, she also unearthed the Helix Stone, and on it the location of a sarcophagus containing an ultimate warrior that nearly brought upon Hell's destruction. Olivia sends out a wave of Argent energy across the entire facility, turning everyone into zombies, and hitting a kill switch on their strongest security. And once Olivia finally goes over the deep end, her mentor, Dr. Samuel Hayden, leads an expedition to Hell to retrieve that sarcophagus, and inside of it, 
was the Doom Slayer. Yeah, you know those games where the main villain is trying to reawaken some ancient demon monster to destroy the world or whatever? Yeah, here in Doom 2016, that trope is completely flipped on its head. You are the terrifying monster. Lore tablets speak about how hell and its demons pissed their pants at the thought of you, once again embracing one of the gameplay elements that made classic Doom so great. Doom Guy is all about killing demons, making a story that doesn't have to pull that all back by turning Doom Guy into some boring ass security guard. Just make him a demigod fueled by nothing but anger and build the story around that, and I'd say they did a pretty good job. They are rage, brutal, without mercy, but you, you will be worse. Rip and tear, until it is done. Wait, rip and tear, isn't that that quote from that old Doom comic published by Marvel for that giveaway? Do they make a huge guts reference too? Almost no time is wasted when you take control, waking up from this tomb and killing demons literally seconds into the game. And most of the in-game story revolves around Samuel Hayden, who may or may not be a walking, talking giant bionicle, trying his best to work with the Doom Slayer while also trying to justify why they went to hell in the first place, which becomes one of his most expensive mistakes when the Slayer ignores him and completely destroys all of his equipment. The Slayer is given a surprising amount of personality for being a silent protagonist. He's just a complete juggernaut of anger, and the first thing he does when he wakes up from his sarcophagus is check for casualties. And once Ultron locks him out to just try to talk to the guy, he throws the computer off to the side. Yeah, fuck Doom 3. He eventually realigns the satellites himself before Ultron locks him out a second time and tells him to come visit him before giving him the numbers and bribes him with Argent Plasma to upgrade his systems. Midway through Hayden's lecture, Olivia sends the core of the UAC into Mel down and the Slayer is sent to go clear out the facility of gore nests so he could turn the turbines back on. Gore nests are essentially the stoplights of an arena encounter, with popping their pimple summoning a handful of demons to fall by your hands, and I really like this. It gives me more control to prepare for the encounter, and just really helps the pacing of the game. Some of these earlier levels are also quite non-linear, letting you approach gore nests whichever order you like, as well as scouring for secrets along the way if you really want to. You can even find the rocket launcher earlier than intended in this stage, which is always appreciated. When her plans to blow the Mars facility fails, she resorts to rerouting all power in the UAC to the Argent Tower, a facility built over the ravine of Argent energy found on the surface of Mars, with Hayden instructing the Slayer to carefully destroy Hell's filters, keeping the tower powered. We are only temporarily disabling the tower. You need to remove each lens individually. Carefully release the hinges. After scaling the tower with the use of the new double jump boots, Olivia retreats to hell with a portal sucking in the Slayer who's forced to follow holograms of beacons left by the team sent to retrieve him from hell in the first place if he wants to get back to Mars, fighting through waves upon demons and mancubi, hell knights, demons, lost souls, and even barons, all of which behave much like their classic counterparts with some small tweaks. Lost souls though have the most drastic change, now rushing you one at a time, forcing you to pay attention to which one is screaming at you. Though I really wish I could just punt one of these guys like a football. Mancubi are the same as usual, but now they have armor alongside their body, forcing you to prioritize their heads. And Cacodemons are the same lovable little meatballs as always, though I wish they got more of a cinematic introduction and weren't first encountered next to the quad damage. Kinda makes their first encounter a bit forgettable. You'll also encounter several- No! No! No, no, relax, those aren't arch files, though they were going to be. These are the summoners, the only real new demon added to the game. They rush around the map, shooting waves of energy at you, and occasionally will summon demons to attack you, but never revive them, and that's the key difference. Though they do strike that classic pose, fucking QUIT IT! There's also the Hellraisers, which you can argue is a new demon type, but honestly I think that they're just a modernization of the Heavy Gunners from Doom 2, though I wish that they kept their beefy look, these guys are a bit scrawny. The Slayer returns from Hell and fights through the destroyed Argent Tower, making his way through the UAC's trams and neon signs to meet with Ultron in person, who installs a tethering system into the Slayer's suit without his consent, saying that he wouldn't have allowed its installation voluntarily. Voluntarily. You know what? 
Fair point. Hayden sends the Slayer to retrieve a BFG from the BFG division because the UAC has its own division for developing big fucking guns. And oh man, does it come with some fanfare. On top of the facility trying to fish you out of the BFG room, the damn room collapses after the Slayer takes it and makes a huge deal about how powerful it is. It behaves like the BFG from Quake 2 and Doom 3, but is way more powerful and uses its own proprietary ammo, no longer sharing ammunition with the plasma rifle. And in exchange, now does a fuckload of damage because ammo is supposed to be super scarce unless you've maxed out the ammo boost rune which now allows bfg ammo to drop from glory kills this destroys any difficulty the game might have had even if you're playing on difficulties like ultra violence or nightmare and yeah i do regularly play these games on ultra violence now i do anyway i have repented of my sins of playing doom 1 and doom 2 on normal Doom 2 wasn't as good, but we'll talk about that later. Once armed with the BFG, the Slayer visits the Helix Stone, the same stone that gave away his own locations in hopes that he could see something that Hayden and Vega couldn't. <laughs> Alright, I forgot to talk about Vega. He's Hayden's AI companion. Cause Hayden, he's a cyborg and not a robot. I know, my mind was blown too. Vega's a sweetheart and didn't do anything wrong. I, I love him. He'll be important later on though. The Helix Stone gives the Slayer a vision of the Crucible, a ceramic metal container in which metals... Wait. An artifact that can store nearly endless amounts of Argent energy that they think that they can use to stop Olivia. The only problem though is that Olivia took the last Argent Accumulator, which they can use to get to hell. Fortunately, Vega locates another active Argent Accumulator that's currently powering the UAC's experimental Cyber Demon. That's right, a goddamn Cyber Demon. The Slayer, of course, destroys the Cyber Demon, which is the first boss in the entire game and we've only got a quarter of the campaign left. Jesus. Pulling out the Hell Battery, keeping it alive, tele Teleports us back to hell. Big surprise! The Cyber Demon has been rejuvenated thanks to being back in hell's atmosphere. That was easy. I love the Cyber Demon fight, though I do think it is a bit too easy. I appreciate that they integrated it into the story so organically, unlike Doom 3. I just think that he needs a bit more health. Even on harder difficulties, he goes down way too easily, and I'm not even using the BFG trick on him. If you fire the BFG and open up your weapon wheel, it still does as much damage as it would if you were normally firing it. It's kind of broken. From here on out, the game is a bit of a gauntlet. I personally see it kind of like the Wily Fortress in the Mega Man games, using elements from all throughout the game to truly test if you've mastered the game or not. With the Slayer making his way to the Crucible through this really neat clock tower level. You even get a remake of Dead Simple from Doom 2. I like this a lot. This is one of my favorite levels in the game. Hey, even John Romero gets a cameo. The Crucible is guarded by the Hell Guards. Not the Hell Guard from Doom 3, but a still pretty decent boss fight. He's got a shield around him unless he's attacking, leading to a really arcadey style boss fight, but I think arcadey is kind of what this game needs. With the second phase forcing you to take on two of them at the same time, though they lack shields, so I'd argue that this is even easier than the first phase. With the Crucible in hand, Hayden tethers us back to Mars with the plan of sending us to the Well, the source of all Argent energy, with the hopes that destroying Vega could create a rift strong enough to send us there. The Well is from a world called Argent Denure the homeworld of a group of heavenly crusaders called the Sentinels, speculated to be closely associated with the Doomslayer. The Sentinels were tasked with protecting Heaven's Argent energy from Hell, until their leaders sold out the location of the Well in hopes that Hell could resurrect his dead son. Which they did do, but only brought him back in the form of the Icon of Sin. What the fuck? Well, I guess that confirms it. The Icon of Sin isn't Satan, it's just some dude's kid. That's kind of fucked up. You know it's a kid, because he's got a free toy inside. After destroying Vega's cooling system, but not before making sure that he doesn't become another casualty in this war with Hell, the massive amounts of Argent energy sends the Slayer to Argent Denure in a short but pretty challenging gauntlet. There's only about three or four arenas, but each of them are some of the most challenging ones we've seen in the game, along with some of the more complex secrets the game has to offer for completionists. Using the Crucible, the Slayer ends Hell's domain over the Well of Argent energy before coincidentally running into Olivia, who's smitten down and becomes the Spider Mastermind? Okay, I won't complain, this is actually a pretty good boss fight. She uses grenades, lasers, some telepathic attacks, which might be a reference to the Spider Mastermind's cut magic attack from Classic Doom, that's pretty cool. And you can see her machinery being damaged and malfunctioning as you inflict more punishment on her, desperately firing lasers as she drags herself along the floor, which makes it all the more satisfying when you give her a root canal with your big fucking gun. <laughs> Olivia's been stopped and Argent Energy has been taken out of Hell's grasp, with Hayden tethering the Slayer back from Argent Denure to tell us how much of a little shit we are for ruining his corporation's plan to sell unlimited energy to Earth, takes the Crucible, revealing it's a fucking lightsaber, and then boots us back to God knows where, and 
that's the ending. I know in my Doom 3 video, I gave that game crap for having an ending that came out of nowhere, and you might think that I'd say the same about this game, but it's completely different here. In Doom 3, the villain doesn't get any resolution and just fucks off, but here we still get closure for our main antagonist, and Hayden wasn't really an antagonist despite being a bit of a dick. This is more just setting him up for what I'm assuming is going to be closure for him in Doom Eternal. But that was Doom. A bit heavier on the story than previous titles, but unlike Doom 3, I think the story is fairly well balanced and executed. The story is pretty well contained between these four characters, and even in moments where Olivia is absent, there's still plenty of conflict between the Slayer and Hayden to keep us on our toes. The gameplay is perfect and constantly evolving throughout the game, with each demon feeling like a piece on a chessboard, something classic Doom had but just cranked up to 11 here. There are plenty of moments where you're forced to clear out every demon in the room, but honestly with Doom 2016's combat, that's never really a chore. And if it begins to feel like one, I'd recommend switching up how you play and using more weapons than just the super shotgun and rocket launcher. I would have liked a bit more variety in the scenery though, as many of the levels do look the same, especially in the first half of the game. Though one thing that really helps it is the soundtrack by Mick Gordon. It's so good. Some games have specific tracks for when you're in ambience, combat, and dialogue, but Doom 2016's soundtrack is completely different. It almost feels like a fighting game. It reacts to how you play, mixing itself to a different point in the song whenever you do something cool, and then going back to the ambient part of the soundtrack whenever things calm down a bit. A personal favorite of mine, of course, is BFG Division, which is just so perfect. Mick Gordon's soundtrack does of course pay homage to the original Doom soundtrack, like how you can hear the imp song in the song Ties That Bind. They even reference the song of Doom 3 in the track Harbinger. Some of these musical references you really have to squint your ears to hear. And I haven't heard anyone talk about this, but I'm 90% sure I can hear Into Sandy City in Vegas Processing. But unfortunately, that's really it for Doom. Doom didn't come with much post-game content. You can revisit previous stages to collect action figures and collectibles that you might have missed because yes, the Slayer's a man with anger issues and a toy collection. That, that's, that's really relatable. Each of these figures unlocks a model that you can view, but that's really it. I wish that we had a hub or something that we could look at all these in. I don't know, the models are cool and all and they add a lot of charm to the game, but I wish it did more with them. They each have their own little Doom guy name, which I really like from Classic Guy Patriot guy and pink guy? <laughs> Oh god. The closest you really have to a new game plus is arcade mode, which gives you an arcade style multiplier meter and skips any story sequences. And also, Snap Map. Snap Map is really cool in theory. It's the closest the game got to having official mod support, which is kinda weird, right? This is the first mainline Doom game on PC that didn't really get any mod support, and that kind of unsettles me in a way. Mods are a way that helps you increase longevity with your game. That's why the original Doom lasted as long as it did, thanks to mods like Brutal Doom and other map packs by other creators. I don't know, I feel like this is a step in the right direction for longevity, and it did help a bit, like there's that dude that made a full MOBA game using Snap Map, and that's really cool. It's really versatile. There is a really cool Doom Eternal recreation by Jimmy Bacon on here. This is possibly the most fun I've had on Snap Map. It's not co-op, unfortunately.
unfortunately, but it adopts features that Doom Eternal is promising to offer, like dashing, one-ups, and blood punches. If you're super excited for Doom Eternal like I am, give this a shot. It might quench your thirst just a little bit. I took my buddy Elliot through some of these, since some of them have co-op, and it was okay. There was this really cool map where you had to protect a bunch of friendly imps from other demons, and a nice modernization of E1M1 from the first Doom. It's a Zambi! So anyway, I started blasting. That, that's not how, how you... I forgot, I forgot <laughs> how to do glory kills! Uh, melee is F by default. Nice. Hey, there's some armor over there. Uh, you could take it. Wait, how much I'm armor are you at? I'm at 75. Oh, fuck it, it's mine then. Cause that was at <laughs> Press the button. E. <laughs> e. <laughs> I don't think this map was made for multiplayer. I miss hearing them say that they crave cheddar. <laughs> Mama. Mama! Mama! Oh, I have other guns. What? What is this? Burst rifle? Oh, yep, that's what the name implies. He's denied. Oh, fuck. oh shit! <laughs> Pot twist. They're vulnerable in the fleshy butt side. Elliot! I no! need help! Our son! <laughs> He's dead, Elliot. He's dead. Fuck! All this is done. <laughs> that shit. was a that was a cool campaign, though. That was actually really nice. I like that. Oh yeah, that's right. Classic maps are back in this game. In every level in the campaign, there's a lever somewhere, and pulling it open opens a door that leads to a room from the classic Doom. Either Doom 1 or Doom 2. It's just that one room though, there's no enemies inside of it or anything, but just entering the room unlocks that level that it's from to be fully playable from the main menu of the game. Some of these are cool, and there is a lot of novelty to it, but this just does not adapt to the original Doom layout. A lot of Doom 1's levels are incredibly claustrophobic because they didn't really have to deal with the third dimension at all with this game. But here in Doom 2016, where a lot of these enemies are redesigned to accommodate for a third dimension, it doesn't really work, especially with the pinkies being armored. This one level from Shores of Hell just does not work because of how many pinkies it throws at you in this tight corridor. It's not fun, I'm sorry. Though the classic Cyber Demon boss fight is back, and I love it just because of how stupid the Cyber Demon looks when he's waddling around. I love him. We did also give multiplayer deathmatch a try too, and it was okay, but I really couldn't give less of a shit about it. The only reason I considered playing it was for achievements, but a good chunk of these achievements are locked behind microtransactions or literally grinding away hundreds of hours into this, and this just wasn't worth my time. But I did have a bit of fun here regardless. I'm not a big fan of the two weapon limit, I respect that games like Halo can pull it off, but if I wanted to play Halo, I'd just go play Halo. There's also some multiplayer exclusive weapons like the grenade launcher and some sniper rifle along with some other weapons. They're okay, you can also use them in snap map if you want, I don't know, multiplayer just didn't really do it for me. The demon transformations are cool and the chainsaw is super fun, but in the end it just makes me want to play the campaign. I don't really want to play this against other players. Whoa, I can Dude. hear you in game. Oh fuck, fuck really? really? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I'm I'm dead apparently. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! I'll get him. I'll get him. I see him. Jesus! I got him. Yes! Shit, oh, someone else the Revenant is too. Yeah, Holy shit, this dude looks like a fucking robot. Yeah, if you look if you go hover on big baloney, you, oh. you see his profile. He looks like a big fucking robot. And he just left. Kill that bitch! Kill that bitch! <laughs> Fuck! I died. Fucking level 50 Finley! My name is Barry Allen, I'm the fastest shit alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck! I died. Shit! It was Finley! Fuck! Uh, I fell! <laughs> There's a demon rune and we got like, we have no time! Wait, I'll get it. There's the nerf 50! Fucking smacky it's, zoom! It's another one. Damn it! I didn't <laughs> equip my rune! You're not allowed to use the rune. Fuck! This map is very green. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck! fuck. Oh, fucking smacky zoo! I, I'm already dead. Get him, kill him, kill him. Yes! What the no. fuck? No, enemy got- No, I got chainsaw! I got disconnected! What? I got disconnected! <laughs> okay, bye, match. I, I ain't trying to catch no smoke. And yet, with all of these non-campaign gameplay options, I just keep coming back to the campaign. The first time I beat it, it took me about nine hours on normal difficulty- Oh, I'm sorry, hurt me plenty. I've beaten the game nearly eight times since I first started writing this video, and this is my third script I've used for this review. And one of those times was on the Deep Howl's Commentaries channel when they had me on as a guest. Hey, go check it out, I'll have a link in the pinned comment. What the fuck? I've never seen this goddamn part. Yeah, same. Uh, there's a- there's a retro room like this in every level in the game. Are you getting I know, the retro but like, rooms, I never got to see it. <laughs> I'm dying Sorry. on a donut right now, alright? Every time I replay this game, I find a new way to play it. 
from switching out weapons quickly to finding weapon attachments that I never really thought I'd get any use out of in previous runs. I only recently found out how amazing the stun bomb is for the plasma rifle, and found out that holding the alt fire for the super shotgun reduces the spread of it. I thought that was just for focusing for some reason, though this does kind of break the super shotgun a bit. I even beat it a few times on the Switch port. I don't think that it should be $60, but the fact that it's playable on the Switch is really cool. This version is the worst performing compared to other console ports, but this version gets the best console port award alone for the fact that it has full gyro control. I personally find aiming with a joystick to be imperfect, often needing crutches like auto aim and stuff, but gyro aim gives you that nice middle ground between mouse and joystick, and the fact that other consoles lack this feature is a damn shame. This version unfortunately does lack snap map. It does have multiplayer, but good luck finding other players. But again, Doom 2016 is one of the greatest video games I've ever played. Is it my favorite? No, I'll always have a soft spot for Mega Man X and the like. But the amount of shit there is to do in this game, from upgrading your runes to scouring every nook and cranny of the game to fully max out the Slayer's arsenal is insane, and I don't think that I'll ever get tired of this game. At least until March. Please god let this game be good, it looks so good. Oh god, why?! <laughs>